Welcome to another interview of uh, conducted by uh, by EFSAS, and this time we have uh, Madam uh, Nargis Nehan with us. Uh, she has she is the former Minister of Afghanistan on Mines, Petroleum, and Industry, and she's also the founder of uh, an NGO called Equality for Peace and Democracy. And currently, uh, she is in uh, Norway. Um, as a political refugee, uh, understandably after the events which have taken place in Afghanistan in the last summer. Um, Madam Nihan, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so as we, as we discussed before we started, Madam, um, before we come to contemporary issues in Afghanistan, especially the human rights situation, uh, particularly the women rights uh, situation in Afghanistan, first of all, we would like to know a little bit more about you. You are, of course, uh, you have been a minister in Afghanistan. You have been very outspoken since the Taliban has come to power. Even in your time as minister, you have been quite outspoken against terrorism and for women rights and, and human rights. Um, it, 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 it just seems a bit unnatural to the rest of the world that uh, a woman like you uh, was just a while ago a minister in Afghanistan uh, while now women cannot even go to school. So how, how has your journey come about? Actually, it's not for the rest of the world, even it's very unnatural for my family to have mm -hmm. someone like me because um, um, my family do not have any political background. They are a middle-class family that always were away from uh, politics and were not interested in politics. And my, fa my father was just having a small business and trying to take care of the family, and that was their life. Um, during civil war, we migrated to Pakistan, and uh, I was 11 years old at that time. So we continued, uh, I continued my education by attending um, a refugee school. And I was very lucky that in 1999, as soon as I graduated from uh, school, um, of course, during the process, I also learned English language. Uh, I took computer classes. So as soon as I graduated from school, I applied for a job with an international organization and I managed to get that job. So that was a huge breakthrough, not only for me, but also for my family, because my family was facing a lot of financial issues by that time. And it was very difficult for them to take care of the basic needs of the house. And as soon as I found that job, I was able to help the family financially. Uh, and then after some time, I also managed to continue my education in the, uh, in the evening. Uh, so in the beginning, it was, they were just seeing me, you know, like as a, as a hardworking uh, and a daughter and trying to help the family. But then slowly and gradually, they saw that, no, she's also interested in continuing further her education. And she's interested in bigger situation of Afghanistan. And she wants to stay engaged, you know, like uh, in other issues. And she wants, she's attending different meetings, uh, different platforms that were coming together in Pakistan, mainly for women discussing women's issues, women's rights, and uh, especially the situation of women under Taliban rule uh, at that time. And then as soon as the interim government established, I just told uh, and told my family that I'm leaving for Afghanistan. It was a huge shock for them because they were not really, and my siblings were still studying. And uh, they said that the situation is not good, perhaps you have to wait. I said, you can wait, but I'm just packing and leaving. So that's how I came back to Afghanistan in 2002. And as soon as I came back, I was very lucky because I found a job uh, in UNDP that the project was working with Ministry of Finance of Afghanistan. And after a few months of hard work, somehow I became more visible, partly because I was one of the very few women that uh, came from Pakistan that I could speak English. I understood the international language. I was engaging with the international community and I understood how to do my job. And, uh, and then I got a job offer uh, by the Minister of Finance uh, to be appointed as the Director General for Treasury Department, which I accepted, uh, but of course with certain condition. And my condition was that I cannot accept a civil servant salary because I want to work for reform and I'm not a proud person. So I have a family to take care of. I have to take care of my own living and I don't have any other source of income except my salary. 
And then UNDP accepted to pay my salary. And uh, I was seconded to Ministry of Finance and I worked for two and a half years as Director General for Treasury Department. So that's how my journey in public sector in the politics um, uh, started. In 2010, suddenly I felt like that I'm not satisfied after working with several ministries as advisors, as director, that in like I was working, but I could see that as soon as I left these organizations, especially Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Education, where I was working as admin and finance senior advisor to the minister, I could see that the team, new team is coming and they, could, they can very easily reverse most of the reforms that you're bringing. So that was very heartbreaking and disappointing for me that, okay, if there is no political way at the higher level, no matter how much you try in one sector, it's not going to get you anywhere. It might get you for some times, but it's easily reversible. So that was the time that I decided to say goodbye to public sector and I uh, went to civil society. I founded the organization called Equality for Peace and Democracy. And I was giving some of my time for the organization, uh, but some of my time trying to build alliances with other civil society organizations and activists. And I was very vocally advocating for women's rights, for human rights, for good governance, and for transparency and accountability in Afghanistan. Until 2014, 2014, once again, I was offered to join the government, and uh, which I accepted. And um, first I joined as advisor to the president, uh, but then in 2016, I, um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I had to go to Germany for my treatment for uh, one and a half years. When I came back, I joined um, uh, back the government and I was offered the job of uh, Minister of Mines and Petroleum, uh, which I accepted. And I thought that at least I can go and I can initiate the reform, everything. And then later on, I can hand over like other sectors to a team and then I can move on. So I served for two years. And in 2019, I resigned from my position because as you know, that in 2018, the peace process started and the peace process somehow, unfortunately, uh, like overshadowed all other developments that were ongoing in Afghanistan. And I could see that there is no environment and there is no appetite for development anymore for investment. So that was the time that I resigned from politics and I thought that it's better for me that I go back. And I could also see that this is the time that many of the vocal women like myself should go and full-time work advocating for women's rights because peace process was undergoing, negotiations was going on. And we had to do a lot of advocacy for, um, for protection of our rights, which we lost uh, after two, uh, 15 August 2021, unfortunately. No, uh, th that is, of course, very interesting, your story. But what I want to know, and I think what, what, what the viewers would also like to know, is that how much resistance did you get, not only from you know, people you don't know or from within the government, but also, like you said, in the beginning, your own family was not very understanding. So how much resistance did you have to fight? I think I was a little bit smart in terms of in like how to play and how to find my way and how to build alliances and uh, create support for myself. For example, in case of my family, uh, I was not very vocal in the beginning because uh, I had to build the trust. And I also had to assure my family that, okay, I'm financially independent. I'm also helping you, but that doesn't mean that I'm setting all the rules at home. So I was very careful that I was not interfering, especially in the kingdom, kingdom of my mom and the family, because I knew that if I touch that, that would create problem for me. So I was dealing, focusing more in like on my uh, siblings in like education, on their well-being, and on myself. Uh, but I knew, and I was giving advice very carefully to my mother, but I was not interfering in those things. So I let them continue the way that they wanted to continue. And I began to inject some reforms here and there to sensitize my family about women's rights and women's issue and gender equality. And slowly and gradually that took the time. And then time came that they themselves began to look up to me and ask for my advice on different issues and ask for my decision. And time came that they became so dependent on me that they were not open and still they are not open to make any decision without consulting with me, which I also don't find it very, you know, like effective because I want them to be independent uh, of me and continue like making their decisions and uh, making their priorities. So that's how I dealt with my family. Within the community, you know that a lot of politics, especially in Eastern families are going on. So you, know, like you have 
uh, once you're out of the, fa the family zone, then you're having cousins, you're having second cousins, you're having communities, and a lot of competitions and politics are going on between the girls, the boys, and the parents and all of them. So my strategy was that I tried to be a, a, away and above all of them. So I didn't participate in any of those uh, um, uh, conflict. And I always tried to treat my cousins like my brothers, my second cousin like my brothers, and I always tried to be there for all of them. Always trying to advise them, helping them in any way that I could, and being there whenever they needed me, being there whenever they were in trouble, even if I couldn't do anything, at least to share their uh, trouble. So I managed to build that uh, trust with them that they could see that, okay, she's not being influenced by her family members, and she's not part of the politics that we are having with her family. She's totally away from it, and she's focusing and she's trying to help everybody, regardless of whatever we are doing to her or her family. And then within the civil service or the ministry or the government, did you feel accepted as an, as an equal? Coming to the civil servants or actually to the society that I began to work, um, I think I never faced that problem with people with my subordinates. I never faced that problem. Because for me, my strategy was that whenever I was working, I was working very hard. And I was making sure that in a very short span of time, I, have, I know the sector that I'm managing. I know the department that I'm managing. So nobody could question my intelligence. Nobody could question my ex expertise and decision-making process. Um, but then the problem that I was facing was mainly with my equals and sometimes with people above me because I was always questioning things, especially when I, when I see injustice happening, discrimination happening, you know, like some wrongdoings in the system. I could not keep quiet about it. So I would say that, you know, why you made this decision, why this program is designed such, why those people are doing these wrong things and nobody's telling them anything. So somehow, if I wouldn't have interfered in some of those things, I think my life would have been much more easier. Because as soon as I was going in any of these sectors, automatically everybody was accepting that, okay, this is her territory, let her do, let, let her deal with it. And don't, if you don't want to mess up with her, don't interfere in her area. But the problem was with me because I could not keep quiet and still I cannot keep quiet as soon as I see injustice, wrongdoings and discrimination. And, and this, and this uh, I would say, you know, pretty um, independent, but also at times in, in our region, uh, interpreted as a as a bit of a rebellious uh, nature uh, has has continued uh, because I I just read um, a letter from you which you have written uh, to the government of Norway because you talked about the peace process and I think you were also one of the invitees to uh, the Oslo peace talks and you have actually you didn't go uh, while you are in Norway um, why not. Why should I? Mm. Taliban had peace talk in Doha for two and a half years. Exactly for two and a half years, they were lying to us. While they kept the Republic side busy, all of us busy with the peace talks in Doha, they uh, continued their attacks and they began to capture province after province until they captured Kabul. And because of them, we lost everything, not only our rights, but our states, our economy, our social fabric, everything is destroyed. Mm. So my criticism was that how do you trust once again that you bring Taliban, especially that half of their cabinet members are on the blacklist of the UN and they're not allowed to uh, still uh, travel, their governments are not recognized. And also what we saw they did since to, uh, August 2015, uh, uh, August 2021 in Afghanistan. So my expectation was that before engaging that level with the Taliban to bring them to their capitals of the country, at least they would have asked them to release the activists. Do not abduct the activists anymore. Do not go after media and civil society anymore and allow girls to go to school. Then we can invite you to our capitals so that we can have discussions. But uh, giving continuous concession to the Taliban and not demanding anything in return, I don't think that is a successful and healthy negotiation. So, so just to understand correctly is that you're not against talks per se. No. You're, you're against talks without uh, any safeguards or guarantees for people's liberties and uh, the, the freedom of expression and their human rights. I'm, I'm definitely not against talks. I'm against effective and productive uh, uh, talks that would result into peace. Uh, 
I'm definitely against waste of time and resources. And with the way that we are dealing with the Taliban right now, I believe we are wasting our resources and our time. And we are continuously projecting this image to the Taliban that they can get away with whatever they are doing. And end of the day, the international community would engage with them and would, uh, if not officially recognize them, unofficially would recognize them and collaborate with them. And regardless of you know, like them meeting or compromising anything. So, so you, you do think that if talks are done without any conditions and without the Taliban mending their ways, in some way, talks like the Oslo peace talks are actually legitimizing Taliban's rule? Legitimizing them and also uh, boldening them and, and empowering them. And because they go back, and um, as soon as they went back, they uh, raided more uh, uh, houses, safe houses. They abducted more activists and civilians. And on top of that, their uh, Minister of Interior is going to the media and he's saying that the international community needs us and whether, if not today, tomorrow they are going to recognize us. Mm -hmm. So clearly their message is that you know, we will get what we want from you, but we're not going to do anything in return. And also show me one government on earth other than the Taliban that they will take their own citizen as hostage. They will not provide the basic service as a government to the citizens. Um, and they're asking the international community for uh, a concessions and incentive to provide the very basic rights of the citizens that any religion uh, have allowed uh, the citizens to have access to them. So, I mean, we also need to look at the Taliban in the bigger context that if we are dealing with the Taliban without putting very clear pressure on them, without getting the basic rights of women granted by them, without allowing them, uh, uh, the, the, the civil society and media to operate in Afghanistan, what message we are sending to other extreme groups around the globe? that they can, any of them can go and they can take a country and then international community will deal with them. Or like we have a set of principles and values that based on that we're engaging with states. So what in, in terms of, so you don't believe this so-called, you know, new narrative that this is a new Taliban, a more moderate Taliban, Taliban 2.0, which has changed and will now behave better than the previous regime. Taliban 2.0 is much more um, dangerous than Taliban 1.0. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is last time when the Taliban came, they didn't hold any grudges against anybody. We had a civil war. The country was torn apart and people were killing each other. They came and the minimum that they could provide for the people was peace. At least physical peace was there, yeah? But then people were not happy because people were asking for education, you know, people were asking for their basic rights, they were expecting developments, they wanted to move forward, and Taliban was not able to do it for them. So we could see that finally resistance started, and at some stage, you know, the resistance was accompanied by international intervention, and then the Taliban was beaten. This time, our table was, if not like for the rest of the world, but for us as Afghans, our table was full. We had a private sector which was functioning, we had a banking system which was functioning, we had state institutions provided, uh, providing services to the people, we had thousands of civil society organizations working for civic activities and people's awareness on a daily basis. We were taking every day one step ahead, if not a lot. Mm. Suddenly they came and they took everything away from us. So, and then they are coming with a lot of grudges. So look what how they are dealing our former security forces, how they are dealing the activists, how they are de dealing with the media, how they responded to the activists when they asked for their for for uh, they demanded uh, work and education and freedom. So this time they come with a lot of uh, um, uh, grievances. There is no chain of command within the Taliban. So last time, if Mullah Omar, wherever he was sitting, if he was signing uh, like a, a, a decree on a on a blank paper, it was acceptable and it was being implemented all around the country. This time, the Minister of Interior is going to the media and is begging his soldiers that please accept and respect the general amnesty that we have announced. They say we don't accept it. We go after like those people that we have grudges. 
And then on top of that, they, they abduct the activists. And as far as I know, they abduct these activists, they took them as hostage, and then they're using that as bargaining chip with the international community. So tell me which government is doing that? And had, uh, did we experience this last time with the Taliban? I don't think so. And, but there is, of course, you know, uh, from your words, I, I understand that the people of Afghanistan are, are do not do also not accept th this new government. But there is this new narrative, which is also playing around, is that the Taliban are actually a Pashtun tribe. They represent Pashtun people. Um, I, I, I think even uh, the prime minister of, uh, of Pakistan actually went so far ahead to say that the Haqqani network is actually a tribe and a Pashtun tribe, which represent the Pashtun people. Uh, how, how do you how do you explain that? Um, I think in the last twenty years uh, there are some mistakes that we have made. So one way or the other, we beside the Taliban, uh, the empowering of the Taliban, the return of the Taliban is also because of the some of the mistakes that we made uh, uh, while trying to reconstruct and rebuild Afghanistan. So I think adopting of a highly centralized uh, constitution. Uh, was one of the biggest mistakes that we made. A very clear division of um, power or a sharing of the power between ethnicities and working on you know, like co coexist with each other was something that we took it very lightly. We thought that it's there, it was not there. And um, many of the, uh, but there are some other uh, tolerable sympathizers that uh, you, you see them in two parts. So one part is that you, know, you have opportunist people that because Taliban are in power, yesterday they were defending Republic, today they are defending, em defending Emirate, and that's because they just want to be connected with power. Mm -hmm. And I, we cannot ethnicize that. Uh, and of course, in order to get closer to the Taliban, in order to, to, to get attention of the Taliban, they are trying to ethnicize everything and show that, okay, we are here, we are supporting you, but it's actually non-Pashtuns that didn't like you. And then you also have some other very extremist and fundamental Pashtuns that they are really not open for, um, uh, for sharing power and for participation of other ethnicities in, 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 in the political structure of Afghanistan because they think historically they are the ones owning Afghanistan and others don't. So in like, why would they come and become like Minister of Interior, Defense, Finance and, and, and Foreign Affairs? So, so in that regard, you, know, you also have those people that they think that, okay, like it's only Taliban that actually could consolidate all the power that we have. Um, is it okay, Junaid? No, fine, fine. Okay. So it's actually um, this group that you know, they, they think that, okay, through Taliban, they can consolidate all the power back and, um, in, like, in the hand uh, for Pashtuns. But then you're, you're also having millions of Pashtuns that they understand that Taliban do not represent them. They are constantly saying that they are even harsher, uh, harshly talking against the Taliban. And they are saying that they don't represent them. The Taliban do not represent them. They are uh, looking forward to you know, like, uh, an inclusive government and trying to find ways and political structure that all of us could coexist with each other. The only thing that we have to find is that how do we do it? How do we all learn to make some compromises, all of us at our own end, so that we are able to build something that if it's not ideal for all of us, it's actually acceptable for all of us. So that is something that I think the educated class of all ethnicities, of especially my generation, uh, has a lot of responsibility to work on that, that first of us, we could, we could convince ourselves we all fight, uh, stop fighting amongst ourselves, and then all of us go back to our constituencies and try to raise their our race and convince them that why we have to work for a national cause rather than like ethnicity cause. But how, how much you, you talk about empowerment and, and empowering uh, the Taliban feels empowered, and then there are tribes and ethnicities which feel empowered. How much actually do you blame? external parties for the empowerment of the Taliban of today, the, the US, the NATO, the Pakistanis, how much do you actually put the blame on these external forces, which you talked in the beginning about the peace process. Well, your government was excluded from the peace process. Um, ironically, the Americans were fighting the Taliban, ended up making a deal with them 
and one can ask the question, what happened to those 20 years and all those people that were killed and the money spent? Uh, on the other hand, there are voices which say the Taliban could have never um, endured this as long as they did not have the support of, of, of the state of Pakistan. So how much do you blame uh, these external parties for the mess that Afghanistan finds itself in? I try to be very pragmatic and I also want to be very honest. Uh, so in that regard, I always divide it into half. I say half of responsibility lies with us Afghans. If we had used the opportunity that we had with ourselves in the last two decades, if we would have invested really on uh, uh, forming of um, the national security forces, equipping them, training them, and not making sure that there is no corruption in that sector, and appointing the right people that they would deliver, and uh, in the building the state institutions, everything, and would provide services for the people, would engage people in the process, and in that somehow try to focus more on like uh, attracting uh, support of people and trying to build these state institutions, especially in uh, which you need it in countries like Afghanistan because we have a lot of vulnerabilities. So in order to be able to continue and to convince everybody not to bring their wars inside Afghanistan, you need strong uh, state institutions and you need, you need very strong national security forces, which we never paid attention. So I think you know, that internal differences that we had, the domestic issues that we had, the ethnical fights that we have, that part, I put, totally blame Afghans and ourselves on, uh, on that part and our leaders on that. Part of it is also the regional countries and the international powers. That yes, you know, you're having your differences. For example, uh, uh, United States have its issue with Iran, with China, with Russia. But that doesn't mean that you bring and you fight that uh, uh, in Afghanistan lands. Same thing goes with Pakistan. You have problem with India, fine. But why would you come and fight, uh, bring that fight in the in soil of Afghanistan? So they also played, and we know the nature of the fight that, in a sense, now everybody's um, having uh, uh, like the, the nature of um, war that we have seen that they are not fighting each other directly. So what's happening that they are using two countries like Afghanistan that they go and they try to fight it there and waging their proxy wars there. So I totally blame Port. 50% of uh, blame on them, but 50% of the blame uh, on Afghans. I don't agree with the Americans when they say that it's all Afghans' responsibility. We did whatever we could. They didn't do it. They didn't do it responsibly. They didn't come responsibly. They didn't give responsibly. And uh, I, bl uh, I blame the countries in the region, including Pakistan, Iran, and others, that they supported the Taliban because they had a problem with the central government. And on top of that, I also blame Afghan politicians and leaders that they just couldn't understand the complexity of the situation. They couldn't also see the bigger picture that they should work for Afghanistan. And for that, they, at least if not united, they should not continue focusing so much on their differences and fight that we lose everything in the way to the Taliban. And, and how much do you blame the phenomenon of corruption in the Afghan government, because uh, first of all, the Americans have been saying this, but now also Afghans have been saying that the Ghani government was corrupt, uh, was very corrupt. Uh, you were also part of the government. I think I've even read, uh, and, and, and uh, forgive me for being so bold, but I've even read a few allegations against your ministry um, so how do you, what do you say about that? Unfortunately, corruption was um, very high and it was very disappointing. I remember that when I was working in the ministry, I had to fight people, those that they, uh, in the system, in the ministry, in the parliament, in the palace, in the ministry of finance. They were, these mafia were so organized that without my knowledge, they were, they were building networks with people working under me and trying to get things done through them. They were building connections with Ministry of Finance, trying to put pressure on me. They were going and meeting the advisors of the president and trying to build connection with them and then the MPs. So I had to fight in so many fronts. And that was the time that like, after two and a half years, when I saw that the situation is so much politicized that there is no appetite for development, fighting corruption, good governance, I said it's better for me that I should leave. Now, um, so it was evident and it was there and corruption played a very important role 
uh, uh, and collapse of the state. So corruption, discrimination, over centralization of power and politics. These three, I think, or the, were the three main pillars that they played. Um, uh, they were the main protagonist in in terms of uh, collapse of everything, collapse of state, and also people not supporting the republic anymore. Now, coming to the case of the ministry uh, that I was uh, leading, uh, look, if some one thing that I do know that corrupt people are very nice, very diplomatic always you know, like politically correct people because they don't want to expose themselves and they know that they have a lot to hide. So they intentionally try to avoid. So I'm someone that I constantly expose myself, forget about others that to expose me. I expose myself by always picking fight with anybody that I think like somehow they have anything to do with the collapse of the state. And that's because I'm end of the day confident and I keep on inviting people and I'm like, you have the whole ministry, you have the whole record, go and investigate in any way that they want, you want to do it. Whether it was the previous administration, the Taliban, any other administration after that. And I say that if you find anything against me, expose it in the media, bring it onward, I'm waiting. The second thing is that yes, there is allegation of corruption because the pre uh, president um, at that time, President Ghani, unfortunately, was someone that um, that he was highly insecure uh, when the peace process started. So he was trusting a very small circle of people. And I had problem with those people because somehow I could see where they were taking him and the government. I was always boldly going and talking to him and telling him what was happening. I submitted two more times my resignation, four page resignation, and constantly naming people that you know, this is what they have done, this is what they have done, this is what is happening. It's, that, that's why I think it's better for me that I should resign. And then time came that uh, they were going after any political opponent, which is very typical of Asian countries, the countries where there is no rule of law, that they go after their opponents with baseless allegations. Now it takes time that like, until you're able to prove that. So in my case, they went against the law. They had no evidence. There was just one uh, 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 story. There was one report saying that like, we have so there was one contract that we uh, processed that and uh, the process of the bidding for that contract, which was for Seoul, that had started before I joined the ministry. When I joined the ministry, it was work in progress. And the MPs from that province were saying that this project is providing a um, job for um, uh, work for 300 people. So if you can process it. I took everything to High Economic Council and every step of the process was explained to the High Economic Council. We have them all in writing and they approved it and we processed everything. As soon as we signed the contract, please pay attention to this part. As soon as we signed the contract, within a month, the USGS contacted us and they said that we saw, we, um, evaluate, we uh, read, read all those geological data. We doubt, it's not sure, but we doubt that in that area, uh, it's not only salt, you also have lithium. So we highly recommend that you, know, if you do not have it as a salt contract because we have to do further a survey and we have to get the data and then in light of that, we have, you need to decide what you want to do with it. So same report went to High Economic Council and the president told me that immediately terminate the contract. I said, okay, I'm sending a request. Please give me the order so that I can terminate the contract. I sent the request to Office of the President. The President wrote it, wrote it right away that it terminated the contract. We terminated that contract. The company was after me for such a long period of time. And then he came, I said, look, whatever you have invested, because I know that you had started the initial work in terms of buying equipment, going to the site, doing the cleaning and all those things. I understand that within one to two months, you have done all those things. But other than that, nothing has happened. So whatever money you have spent and resources you have spent uh, in the initial period of the project, please um, bring us the request. We will assign a committee and we can give you compensation for that. But if you're thinking of trying to uh, uh, revoke the, uh, the, the, the contract and continue work, that's not possible because we already have the approval and it is a very serious issue. So the company kept quiet and this was just be, as soon as I jo joined the ministry. After two years, when I had my political differences um, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the president and his advisors, I resigned from my job and I was very vocal with the president talking about not only uh, 
uh, corruption, but also sexual harassment of young women that I was very much critical about. So I left my job. Uh, the only thing that I they knew that I knew a lot because I was in the system. And they were kind of afraid that, okay, what will happen once you go to civil society? Of course, you know, like I wanted to talk about it, but I also knew that you know, like I'm living in Afghanistan, my family's in Afghanistan, so I have to be very careful how much risk I can take. After that, the company, as soon as I left, the company went to the new minister. And then he, they told the new minister that we want you to help us out to be able to reactivate that, that, uh, project, that project. So the complaint went to the new minister. The new minister wrote a, a, a report and sent it to the president. And then the president was like, OK, do the investigation and tell me what's happening. The investigation, when it happened, they said, OK, she has signed in this part, and this part was the forms were, forms were not filled properly. That part is done. You know, those small administrative things. And then they just use as excuse to introduce not only me, but 17 other people to, minister, to attorney general. And then against the laws of Afghanistan, before even doing the investigation and proving what is happening, they leaked everything to the media just to assassinate our character. I had to go to the media within this within an hour, and I said it's baseless. I am inside Afghanistan, unlike other politicians that they are running away, they are leaving. I am sitting inside the country. Come and do your investigation and come up with the report and prove it what's happening. So you still say you say to your critics today as well, those who accuse your ministry of, of corruption that prove me, prove that my ministry was corrupt or that you were corrupt, mm -hmm. and I'm willing to face everything not only that do the investigation inside afghanistan all around the country if you find anything any money i mean there is a small amount of money that i have earned through consultancies that i'm doing but a very small amount of money but if you find any significant amount let's say over hundred thousand dollar in my name any of my family members any of my relatives come and hold me into account i'm ready for it that, Just don't find it. It's a digital world. That 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 is very that is very forceful. But that that is of course your ministry. Do you believe, or do you think that Ashraf Ghani was as corrupt as they say? Ashraf Ghani was very much into power. Um, he wanted to be in power. He wanted to be remembered as someone who basically saved Afghanistan, as a savior of Afghanistan. When you have that ambition, then money is not that much important for you. But in the process, Ashraf Ghani realized that he cannot play politics without money. That's one thing. The second thing is that Ashraf Ghani also became very dependent on a small circle of young men that he thought that you're loyal to him, they will do anything for him. Now, what all those people were doing at his back, or at least with his consent, is something that I think it's it's out in public and you know what has happened. All these people, I mean, they are all out. Just go and see what kind of lifestyle they are having. I am in Norway right now. I am dependent on social security until I manage to find a job. And I'm proud of that. But those people, they are all they also left Afghanistan. They already have their businesses, they are making investments, they are having you know, like their villas. They are, the kind of lifestyle that they're having speaks millions about in like uh, what they have done and like how much money they have made. Okay, that is that is again very evident for everyone to see. We have seen recently uh, some of Ashraf Ghani's um, advisors with pictures on social media exp explaining how 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 lucky they are and how how nice they are living. Uh, this was, of course, a lot about the past and, and what has happened and how we came here. Uh, moving towards today, um, before we come to the particular fact of, the, of, of women rights in Afghanistan, how is the situation of human rights in Afghanistan? It's really bad. Uh, so at this situation in Afghanistan, uh, Taliban are abducting uh, women's rights activists, um, protesters, civil activists, journalists, uh, former government employees, they are humiliating them, they are torturing them, they are, uh, they are uh, taking false statements from them, from them, they are killing them in public uh, with you know, false alleg uh, allegations. And uh, even when they are releasing them, being under the pressure of the international community, 
They are taking statements from their family members that they're not going to go to the media, they're not going to share information with anyone, and they're not going to participate in any kind of activities um, uh, against the Taliban. Uh, so that is the situation uh, right now inside the country. And all these things are happening at a time when Taliban were coming to Oslo, they were traveling to Geneva, and soon they will be traveling to UK. So it's happening under the nose of the international community. Absolutely, in front of them, in front of their eyes. And the international community is silent. The international community is waiting and watching because they think that they have to be very pragmatic. I think for them, the priority is to establish some sort of contact with the Taliban. Uh, they want to criticize Taliban, but not so much publicly, but more in private meetings. And they think that perhaps that might help uh, in terms of like convincing the Taliban to reform their policies and become more moderate. So this, this uh, hope of the international community in the beginning, that because the Taliban needs international community recognition aid in order to survive, it will make them less, less brutal. Uh, this hope has been shattered. This hope is partly shattered, partly uh, I think it, uh, the international community, um, I mean, we also have difference of culture. So what I have seen that um, they don't understand that in Eastern countries, people promise one thing, but they deliver another thing. So we are not very much honest and frank in our communications and in our, uh, uh, in our statements. Still, they come and they tell us that, oh, we had a meeting with the Taliban and they promised, they were so sympathetic about women's rights and they say, we are going to discuss it and we are going to try to resolve it. And, um, and then in action, you see that they are doing two, three different things. So I think it takes, I believe that it will take some other months or maybe more than months to the international community to fully understand that how Afghans and especially with the Afghans, Eastern and especially Taliban are, are, are uh, operating so that then they understand and based on that, they, they can make their own calculations of how much they can trust the statements that they are getting in formal platforms from the Taliban. And, and coming then to women's rights, uh, of course, you have, you have, you've, you've painted a very grim picture of the human rights in general, but women have in Afghanistan under the Taliban rule also previously they have been uh, the worst sufferers of uh, of, of abuses. Um, there, there are two two things to my question. One is, of course, what is the situation of the women's rights in Afghanistan? Secondly, why is it that women that that the Taliban is always so afraid of the women of Afghanistan? Previously as well, this time as well. Why is is it because the women because they fear the women? Or is it because they are the weakest members of society, so it's easy? Um, with regard to, um, I think it's a combination of several things. First of all, um, they, they, are, they never had exposure of, you know, like dealing with strong women mm -hmm. because they are, they, they are raised in families where they have seen like women being submissive, obedience, and taking always in the care of others and, and like sacrificing for others and not questioning anything. So that is the major of women, good woman that they have in their mind, yeah? So woman speaking their, uh, uh, her mind, uh, prioritizing her needs and, like, uh, and, and having her demand is something that they don't, they're not used to it and they're seeing it for the first time. This is not only the case with the Taliban, but with many, many even educated Afghan men that I have seen that they find it very hard to deal with a uh, vocal and strong woman who speak their mind and who doesn't get influenced easily. Uh, and then like you also have a very close culture because Afghanistan has been in fight in the last four decades. So people did not have the exposure of you know, like seeing that, okay, like how other societies are treating their woman. What, uh, what are the indicators of a normal you know, like, um, and peaceful society? And how important it is and how prideful it is that actually you respect women and you give them the freedom that they require and uh, like how powerful it is. So I think a lot of awareness raising education is needed uh, in that part. And par partly it's also because of masculinity of the society that we have that somehow main thing that they are the dominant group and they are in control and by allowing women to have you know, their own voice 
make their own decision, they are losing that control. So I think it's a combination of all these things which are making things uh, much more harder for Afghan uh, women. But one thing that inspires me is that no matter how tough the Taliban and other men are in Afghanistan and other um, male-dominated society, I have seen, at least in my country, that women are much more tougher than that. If women decide to create problems within the families, there is no way that men will be able to, to, to overcome that. So for men, what I have seen, that no matter how powerful they are outside, as soon as they get inside home, the, the, their conclusion is that do not mess up with the men, women at home and like, just you know, like do whatever they say. So basically, you know, like they do act, accept and respect that, okay, women are the dominant groups within the family and we have to respect that. Now, they do have that fear that, okay, once this group gets outside in the society, how do we deal with them? Because the way that they are dominating the families, they will also begin to dominate in like every discussions within the society. And then women are also coming with very rightful, you know, like um, uh, uh, principles. So for example, women are fighting for justice, they're fighting for, uh, 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 for reform, they're fighting for rights of the minorities, they're fighting for equalities, they're fighting for the liberty. So also they think that, okay, it's not only women, but actually it's overall control that we've been losing in the society. Because once women are out there, it's not only for their rights that they'll be fighting, it's also for the rights of others and all these other issues that they'll be fighting. And then controlling that is going to be very difficult for them. The best example is the women protesters that while Taliban had the guns you know, on their forehead and, uh, and, and warning them to go back to their home, but still they were shouting and they were asking for their rights and even they were asking that you know like you've taken our country you destroyed everything we want education we want liberty and all we form an inclusive government so they could see that okay demand is not only limited to their rights as soon as they get out it's going to be much more bigger than that you know we have seen these brave women coming out on the street but recently we have also seen some taliban uh, some talibs actually uh you know, hitting them or, or forcing them. Um, and how long will it take before they will go back to their previous methods of executing women in public, beating women in public? How long will it take? In some provinces, they have already gone. So, uh, 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 you know, lynching women, stoning women, uh, that informal justice have already started in a few provinces by Taliban soldiers. The only thing is that they have not formalized it yet the way that they did it last time, but it is happening in practice. It's just that they're not formalizing it because of the fear of the reaction of the international community that they have. But what they're doing right now to have one woman is actually worse than what they were doing to women outside. At least it was very clear last time that you know, like they had they had a policy and families were complaining and then after that you, they would come and they were uh, they would make the decision about uh, different issues but right now they go after any woman that you know, like she's active in social media she's criticizing anything or if she's going out you know like and, and like as as is trying to go out without a male company they are doing all those things in in, uh, in practice it's just that they are not admitting it as their formal policy because they are they know that there will be reaction from the international community so they do it in 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 areas where there is less media yes. less attention and then the other thing that they have done that in many of the provinces, uh, even in Kabul, they have started warning medias that you know, they are doing public executions, they are doing the stoning and all these things, but then they don't allow media, even they warn people that you know, if we see you taking the videos and your uh, mobiles, then we're going to come after you. But it's very much brave of the Afghan people that no matter how much they try to control everything one way or the other way, they try to take video and then within an hour, it's out on social media. And then there are all reactions. So right now, social media has become a very strong and effective tool for people to expose what Taliban are doing. And for the rest of us that we are in exile to react with what Taliban are doing. But you just talked about the intertwining of the patriarchal system and culture, and of course, religion. Um, you are an Afghan woman. You're not wearing a burqa. You've been in Afghanistan. You were not wearing a burqa there. Mm -hmm. How much of these, these, these demands of the Taliban, when they say that women need to wear a burqa, they can't go out with a, without a male uh, chaperone, uh, they can't study. 
how, how much of this has to do, because how much of this has to do with culture, the patriarchal system or religion? A lot has to do with culture and patriarchal system and very less has to do with, uh, with Islam. We have seen Islamic countries uh, uh, in our neighborhood, for example, Pakistan. I mean, women are having all their freedom and, and all other Islamic countries except uh, the Islam, uh, the Iran, but even in Iran, they are not uh, implementing the version of the Sharia that Taliban are trying to implement. And very interestingly, when the whole negotiation started, they kept on talking about women's rights in like according to Islam. Many of us were very quick that we began to educate ourselves and try to like training programs and understand, okay, like what is our right? And like, let's say, like explain. And I remember that even we formed um, a network of uh, Islamic scholars, progressive ones. And we were asking these questions that can you like, can you explain to us about this issue, that issue, even about you know, like the political order, about Islamic Emirates, like the model of governance, everything we're trying to educate ourselves that, okay, let's get as much as information as we can so that we can go to the negotiation table, whether it's track one or track two, we can challenge Taliban or if they mention, at least we can debate with them. And then we began to practice that some of us in some of the track two dialogues or track one that we're going that, okay, Islam is saying that, what do you mean about this? And also in some cases, we also had some progressive Islamic scholars that actually in between, they were giving clarification and they were actually more technically um, uh, uh, questioning them. So they realize that, okay, they are educating themselves and there is no way with the connectivity that we have right now that we can tell them that everything is, uh, we are doing it is actually Islamic because we are telling them, I remember in one of the uh, meetings that I had with some of them in track two and they said, oh, we will come back with Islamic Emirates. I said, if you're bringing the Islamic Emirate, which is in UE, I accept it actually, bring that Islamic Emirate, that version for me. So those kind of questions, and especially with the changes that we saw happening in Saudi, they didn't have any model to lean on after that, to say that, okay, this is the model that we're bringing in Afghanistan. So that people, and people would not question that. Then automatically when we, they know that we were organizing ourselves to challenge everything with Islamic uh, uh, debates and justifications, they say, oh, Islamic and culture values. So after that, the culture and Afghani uh, values also began to attach to them. So now whatever they cannot justify uh, according to Islam, then they say, oh, it's because of our culture values. But what we have seen is that it has to do a lot with culture and patriarchy in Islam religion. But, but, but 40 years ago, you also had the same culture. And then this was not there. 40 years back, we didn't have many countries supporting uh, fundamentalism, extremism. We didn't have thousands of madrasas in our neighborhoods, brainwashing people and sending back, them back to Afghanistan. People were not trained to be suicide attackers. So 40 years back, things were very, very simple. That's an interesting point yeah. to say about the madrasas because a while ago, I talked to uh, a former senator of Pakistan, Mr. Afrasiab Khattar. And he said that, and you're actually corroborating that, he said that many Afghan refugees who went to Pakistan to refugee camps were actually then trained in madrasas and sent back to fight. So you, you do think that this infrastructure of extremism within the region has changed Afghan culture? Totally, it totally destroyed our social fabric. Hmm. Today we have, and it's the, my worry is that, and I remember that since 2006, I kept on mentioning it to the international community. I said, okay, let's make peace with the Taliban. Yeah, I said, but what about those factories that they are continuously producing Taliban, more Taliban for us? What do we do with the rest of them? Do, does that mean that every time, every decade, we have a negotiation process and we make peace with a new group and then there's another group coming into being? So I said, until we don't address this issue that where the extremism is coming from, who are supporting them, who are funding them, where are the Taliban taking their arms? Because Afghanistan is a landlocked country. Where are they getting these arms from? Where they're being they're getting the arms from. So, I mean, until you don't ask these very difficult and fundamental questions and you don't answer them, there's no way that I honestly think Afghanistan could experience peace and have a durable peace. So how should we address these issues then? Because by naming them, we are of course not solving them. And it's very, it's, 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 it's very interesting you talk about the social fabric because, you know, as you know, I come from the region of Kashmir and we have equally, you know, our social fabric has been equally destroyed 
by this extremism in the region. Uh, so, so basically, we I think we the, the people of Kashmir and the people of Afghanistan share a lot of uh, have a lot of in, in common. But how do you address it then? Because the so there are two ways that I think we can address this. And one is the very optimistic and you know like and and I I don't think possible. And the other will one you know, like is difficult, but the possibility is there. So one way is that you know, like you have dialogues, you discuss and you say, okay, whatever issue is there between Afghanistan and Pakistan, Afghanistan and Iran, or any other country in the region, let's begin to resolve them. Let's begin to discuss and find you know, like come up with a new uh, uh, in a, a social or political contract between these countries that we are not going to wage extremism in the region and in Afghanistan. And that is because, and then focus on regional connectivity, economic development, and all those things. That sounds very we novel. tried in the last two, two decades, and it, it doesn't work. That sounds very novel. That is not going exactly. to happen. It's not going to happen. And we saw it's not happening. The second thing that I see is happening that with the Taliban coming in power in Afghanistan, soon you will see that the Taliban in Pakistan are also going to be, be, begin to claim power and they are going to negotiate. Either they will try to get a good you know, like a share of power from the government or they begin to organize themselves to be able to um, you know, fight the system and take, take, take over everything the way that they have taken in Afghanistan. And then you know, like it's also going to begin, begin to spill over in other countries as well. So unfortunately, extremism and fundamentalism and the model that we create in Afghanistan that, okay, you come, you fight, you take a, a state and you took the people as hostage and everybody's going to deal with you. That is going to become the trend and it is going to affect all the countries. And then slowly and gradually, you are going to have fundamentalism and extremism so much expanded and so much strengthened that it would not be only Afghanistan, but many other countries like Pakistan and others that they will be taken over and they will be run by these fundamental groups. And the solution to that is to, to... And that would be the time that many of these countries would begin, the educated society would begin to realize that, okay, if we focus only a small box of our own country, there's no way that we can save it. So time has come that we have to have a regional consensus and a regional uh, strategy and approach for um, addressing fundament fundamentalism and extremism. But you know yourself, you know yourself that regional consensus and, and, and strategy is not going to work. The Haqqani network within the Taliban is, an, is a group on its own, uh, has its own supporters. There is the ISK, uh, ISK in Pakistan. You have Al-Qaeda or remnants of Al-Qaeda in Pakistan. They have their own power struggle. And then you have the power struggle of the states. Today, the US might use the Taliban against the ISK. The Pakistanis might use the Haqqani network against the Taliban. It looks very, very grim. So a consensus, I, I don't see that building. Well, the way that I see it is that there is no, um, uh, there is no um, chain of command that we had previously within the Taliban. As you very rightly say right now, there are three wings that they have their own internal disagreements and their own internal issues. So while you have Mala Brother group, you have um, Mala Yaqub's group, and then you have Haqqani's group, that all of them are fighting for their own strength and for their own legitimacy. You also have ISS that when they come and they try to uh, challenge everything. And then on top of that, you have the national resistance forces that people don't take them seriously today, but it's today. Tomorrow is going to be very different than today. You also have the people of Afghanistan, the women, the youth, that they have to take different aspiration. And for them, the model of governance in Afghanistan is so different than the Taliban. So all these, I think, like bits and pieces would come together. And the, the disagreements and the fragmentation that we have inside the Taliban would bring the Taliban to the point that either some of them would give into formation of inclusive government, giving people their rights and trying to do things differently. And then many of them will be, will be toppled by these people. So, which I unfortunately is going to be very bloody and it's going to be very difficult and it will have a lot of destructions. But if you're not listening to the people and allowing them to express themselves uh, in a true civic means and do not engage with them, you, you do, you're not leaving them with any other choice but to equip them and, and apprise and resist against them, their, you know, whoever is in power. 
Which is that's what I see in Afghanistan. I think uh, the summer of 2020 and is going to be bloody for us. You will see formation of pockets of resistance uh, in different parts of the country and all of them in their own way. And then you also know the politics and complexity of the region. So there will be some countries that you know, they will provide equipments, resources to these groups and will help them to fight the Taliban. So we are where we were in 2003 and four back. And what if, what if these can, what if these some countries uh, provide uh, assistance and weapons to not the Taliban but the Haqqani network or ISK? What what if what if tomorrow the Haqqanis are the most powerful group in Afghanistan? That is that's why I say that you know, it's very complex because as soon as any country would decide, one country would decide to support Haqqani, there will be another country trying to support Mullah Yaqub. Then there will be another country trying to support Mullah Brother. And then there will be some other countries you know, supporting the, these pockets of resistance. So the country, very unfortunately, with the way that we see right now, is moving towards um, civil war. I say civil war, regional war, whatever you name it, but it is going towards uh, a bloody war. And with the way that the world is dealing and responding, I don't think they are seriously understanding the issue and trying to address it before we get to that position. And what can the women do in, 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 in how it's going to go into a civil war with men fighting um, and these women bravely on the streets of Kabul, we have seen, but probably also in other provinces and cities uh, calling out for their rights. How much, how much leverage or power do they have? What, what can the women do? We need to uh, organize ourselves more in like to understand these um, different islands of the politics and power, and then see that how do we deal with them, uh, which is still in the beginning, but with the way that I see it, some of these groups like for, uh, might be more uh, um, smarter that they approach the woman. For example, some of us were approached by the National Resistance Front leader, uh, office a few weeks back that he wanted to have um, brought a consultation with women that he wanted to report on what is happening on their front and like what is happening and like and like how what they can do and how they can collaborate with women and um, so like some of these groups might be in like smart enough to see that okay like in these lines we can build alliances with me with, with women we can consult with them and we try to get their support but the way that I know most of these women uh, we try to stay neutral in the whole process and we try to focus on our own rights. And for us, what's important that in like with any of these groups that we are engaging, we are focusing on like demanding for our own rights. When there are more competition, it makes it easier for us because one of the ways, one of the chips that they will be, I'm sure some of them will be using is that, okay, like how do we form alliances with women? And I hope that you know, some of the wings of the Taliban would also understand that. And then they also begin to you know, like talk and grant women some of their rights, uh, which is going to be difficult. But I do know, for example, more brothers, whether they are lying or they are, this, this is the truth, but they do keep on saying to the international community that we still want to uphold, uphold the promises that we made in Doha for you in terms of women's rights, but the problem that we have is Haqqani, they don't accept with us. And right now, for us, consolidation of our own power and internally uh, organizing ourselves is more important than this. So when there are more competition, that creates more opportunity for us. But if there is civil war, then who are you talking with? And, and do, do you see... Much more difficult. You date the Haqqani network again. Do you see the Haqqanis coming on board? With women? Yeah. And no, no, not even at this stage, not even Mullah Brothers Group are coming on board. The only thing that, that I, I told you that they mentioned to the international community that we still want to uphold the promises that we made, but it's just because of a county group that we can't make it. But we don't know whether they are lying or this is the truth, because until you don't see anything in action Taliban, you cannot trust them by words anymore. Okay, Madam Nihan, we, of course, I know that you have something um, soon so i'm going to try to come to the end of this of this talk and I'm, I'm going to ask a very specific question we have talked about culture we have talked about the patriarchy religion uh, and we have also talked a lot you have i find it very brave of you that you have called a lot for introspection within the afghan community 
within the people of Afghanistan themselves, uh, because it's easy to, to point fingers. Uh, and you have also said what the Afghan people and especially the women should do to bring about a change in the situation. So that we have dealt with. Now specific, what do you think, because this can't happen, Afghanistan wasn't ruined by the people of Afghanistan, at least not alone. It was ruined by different actors. So in this process, what is it specifically that a few actors should do in order to bring about a peace? That is one, what is the role of the US? What should the US do? What is the role of the larger international community in countries like you and I are sitting, like Norway, like the EU? And two most three most important countries within the region, Iran, Pakistan, and India. What should these regional and external actors do to bring about the change? Um, I think one, if we are talking, if we leave the politics for a few seconds aside and we look at Afghanistan from a very humanitarian perspective, Afghanistan needs a break. Mm -hmm. We have suffered a lot. And time has come that everybody built a consensus that we need to give a break to Afghan people. That's one thing, but that is, as you said, very novel. We are, while we know that they all agree, but none of them would do that. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that I think it's important for, um, I, I personally believe that it was a big mistake of the international community, the EU and the US, uh, withdrawing so responsibly from Afghanistan and then leaving everything for their competitors in the region. So that's what has happened right now. And in case of Afghanistan, the more they leave Afghanistan at the mercy of the players such as Russia, China and others, the more difficult it's going to be later on for them to, to get engaged in Afghanistan issues. And, um, and with regard to that, it's important that at least they identify that, okay, it's not only Taliban, but who are the other players? And at least they not only engage, but try to recognize those players. For example, in case of women, my uh, uh, message on to the international community is that we need same level of recognition from you that you have given to the Taliban when they were in Qatar. We are not asking you to you know, open an our office for us in Qatar to have our own negotiation, but what we are saying that at least amplify our, our voice and try to like, recognize that we are a part of society. And if we have accepted the Taliban, and if you're trying coming and advocating to us that we should accept the Taliban, we should make some compromise for peace, we want you to go with the same message to the Taliban and other politicians. Uh, I think for, for formation of a truly and meaningfully government and Afghanistan would help everybody. Uh, if not, um, what is happening in Afghanistan will have its own consequence and impact on countries in the region, such as Pakistan, Iran, uh, and the, the Central Asian countries, and as well as, uh, uh, as well as India. And then on top of that, for the European countries, it's going to be a huge influx of the refugee that they're going to have. I mean, think about it. Everybody, like, why thousands of people rush to airport as soon as Taliban took over? Yes, partly it was fear, but partly it was also because of the frustration. The people were like, okay, Taliban are here. There is no hope for the future of country anymore. We have to leave. So I think until you don't create a society where people have a hope for a better tomorrow, there is no way that you can convince the people to continue to live there. So that influx of refugee would stop only if we actually give the people that assurance, that hope back in Afghanistan. That's why it's important for the uh, European countries that beside the humanitarian support, they also look for a political solution for Afghanistan. And then countries in, uh, such as um, US and others, I mean, they already um, discredited uh, their own role as a superpower with the irresponsible withdrawal that they had in Afghanistan. But the more that they leave Afghanistan at the mercy of others, the more they will be blamed historically, the more it's going to be difficult for them to constructively engage them, themselves back in the region. So I think it's important that they come forward and um, they identify you know, different players in Afghanistan. And then at least if they are not in like supporting, at least they recognize other groups such as uh, youth, women, artists, activists, and others, and the way that they supported and they somehow empowered Taliban to basically like against the Republic, the time has come that they also support these groups, not against the Taliban, but actually to create pressure on the Taliban and open them up for an inclusive government and as well as a political solution. Uh, 
Because right now, what I find disappointing that on one hand, Taliban are there. They claim that they have taken Afghanistan by power, which is not the case. We know that it was not the case. And then secondly, we are constantly being told by the international community that, oh, Taliban are there. They are the reality of the society. They control Afghanistan. And you have to accept that. I accept that today, but I know that it's not going to be the case for tomorrow. And how much can the international community in terms of terrorism tomorrow, God forbid, if something happens originating from Afghanistan or the region while leaving Afghanistan to the Taliban, while legitimizing the Taliban, while putting them in power, how much does the West then have itself to blame? Well, if they blame themselves, there's a lot that they criticism and blame that they take right now. But unfortunately, we are dealing uh, with unjust and unequal uh, uh, um, global politics. That's why the blame must always has to go towards our funds, not themselves. Otherwise, I mean, in their fight against terrorism after 20 years, um, they went and they made peace with the Taliban while those of us that we are exiled still we are struggling and we are, we are, we are continuing that fight. So who is seriously fighting for terrorism? No, well, they have to take the blame. Point. Yeah. They have to take the blame whether they like it or they don't like it. They are responsible for what happened to Afghanistan today as well. And they will be absolutely responsible for what happened, uh, what will be happening tomorrow. But whether there will be any accountability or not, I'm not sure. Well, that's exactly why I asked the question is that the Afghan people probably find themselves with between the devil and the deep sea is that one, they have to deal with the Taliban oppressive regime. And if there are counter terrorism measures, most probably it's the common Afghan people who are going to suffer the most. Yeah. Uh, and in that sense, you say that um, one of the first things which the, which the Afghan people and Afghanistan needs is a break. Uh, and a break in the sense of humanitarian aid. Of course, that opens up another discussion which we have some other day is that to whom should that aid go? To NGOs like, uh, like, like Equality for Peace and Democracy through the UN, through other mechanisms, because I'm sure that if the aid directly goes to Taliban officers that they will probably not bring that to the people. Yeah, absolutely. Madam Nargis Nehan, thank you very much for this very, very interesting interview. And I think we, I had a lot of questions and I think I just managed to go through maybe 10% of them. But for that, maybe the best thing is once this whole COVID situation opens up a little bit, that you uh, visit us here so that we can have a few days of discussion and not all for publication, but just to uh, educate us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope that our discussion was productive and the, the viewers and listeners will also find them productive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Yeah.